Welcome students to chapter 10, which focuses on the muscular system. Um, and specifically, we're talking here about skeletal muscles. Um, so while the bulk of this chapter is really focused on um, all of the different muscles in the body, what they do, where they are, kind of how they work together, um, we're going to cover that in lab. Um, no, here in the lecture class, we're really just going to focus on um, kind of some of the basics of muscle mechanics, um, including levers. Um, so when we talk about muscle tissue, we're talking about any tissue that has the ability to contract, any tissue that has the ability to take chemical energy found in the bonds in our body and turn it into mechanical energy in the terms of contraction. So that is skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. This particular chapter, chapter 10, really focuses exclusively on skeletal muscle. Um, and so one of the things that we're going to cover here um, and that will kind of overlap with lab a little bit is how kind of muscles interact um, in order for us to walk and talk and, and do all the uh, amazing moves that we can do. Um, and then also how we name muscles and what we, information we can learn um, about a muscle by looking at its name. Um, and then leverage and, and the principles of lever systems. Um, so the thing about muscles is that they can only pull, right? So they're attached to usually bones, as you can see in the figure. Um, and so muscles can't push. Um, they, they can only pull on the, on the bones. However, we can do motions that, that are like opposite to each other, right? We can both flex and extend the forearm. And so essentially what one muscle does, maybe flex the forearm um, by pulling, then another muscle undoes um, by essentially pulling the bone in the other direction. So muscles t attach to our skeleton in at least two points. Um, one of those points is going to be the origin. The other point is going to be the insertion. The origin is the immovable point. The insertion is the movable bone. Um, and so when a particular muscle contracts, when it pulls on its insertion from its starting point, its origin, the insertion will move closer to the origin. And so you have a muscle here, the brachialis, that originates here, inserts down here, and when this brachialis contracts, the insertion moves closer to the origin, and in this case, the um, forearm will flex. Um, so if we have one muscle that does this, right here on this side, we have to have another muscle that can undo it so we can extend our forearm. And muscles do actually come in pairs like that. Um, so the agonist or the prime mover is the muscle that is responsible for a particular motion. Um, so the biceps brachii here contracts and the forearm flexes. Well, its antagonist is the muscle that causes the opposing motion. It undoes what the biceps just did. In this instance, that would be the triceps brachii, which when it contracts, then extends the forearm. They are located on opposite sides of the joint at which they are acting. Right? The biceps is anterior, the triceps is posterior, but they're both acting on the elbow joint here. So when the agonist in this instance contracts, the forearm flexes. When the agonist in this instance contracts, the forearm extends, and they are antagonistic to each other, meaning what one muscle does, the other muscle undoes. Flex, extend, abduct, adduct, pronate, supinate, etc., etc. Um, now, typically, muscles oh, on the anterior, anterior side of a joint will produce flexion, and muscles on the posterior side of a joint will produce extension. The exception to this is the knee, where the posterior muscle causes flexion and the anterior muscle causes extension. But typically, muscles like the pectoralis major here, uh, located on the anterior side of the body, are going to flex that joint that it happens to be attached to, which in this instance is the shoulder, um, so it flexes the arm. Whereas latissimus dorsi, located posteriorly, is going to move the arm as well, but it's going to allow you to extend the arm. Muscles that are located laterally, like the deltoid here, tend to cause Abduction, whereas muscles that are located medially are ones 
like the Terry's major here, that cause adduction. Um, so again, what one muscle does, the other muscle undoes. They're moving the same joint, but they're moving it essentially in opposite directions. Agonist and antagonist. We also have muscles that are known as synergists, um, which are essentially accessory muscles. They basically add a little extra force. So right, if you have a couple muscles that cause a particular motion, you can get a stronger contraction, or they might um, kind of stabilize or uh, reduce some sort of unnecessary movement. Muscles that do that are a special type of synergist called a fixator. Um, the fixators are synergists that kind of tack down a bone or a muscle's origin so that it's completely and utterly um, a really stable base upon which the um, the muscle then the other muscle then could move uh, the prime mover. Um, if we have a nice if the prime mover has a nice stable base upon which it can act, because um, sometimes they don't, um, then it the prime mover can do its job much better. So now there are about 700 or so, well, actually a little more than that, uh, muscles in the body. And so um, muscles don't just do one thing. They, they usually do multiple things. They'll be the prime mover or agonist for one type of movement. They'll be an antagonist for a different type of movement, um, and then they very often may be a synergist for a third movement. Um, when muscles work together, they may cause something different than when muscles work apart. Um, and so you kind of have to do kind of pay attention to that, which can get a little confusing um, for students, but if you take it kind of muscle by muscle, it's, it's definitely something you guys can handle for sure. Um, now, one of the things I do like about studying the muscular system and that I think is really um, helpful to students is that um, the way we name skeletal muscles actually tells us a whole lot about that particular muscle. So for instance, um, we could look at the name of a muscle and find out its location. What bone or body region is it in? So for instance, the temporalis muscle is a muscle that's over the temporal bone. We can also look at the shape of the muscle. Sometimes um, the, the shapes of the muscles uh, show up in their names. Uh, for instance, uh, deltoid means delta, right? Means triangle. And so the deltoid muscle is a somewhat triangular shaped muscle. Um, we can also look at the relative size within a group of muscles. So if you have a, a bunch of muscles that are in like the same area, um, like uh, the gluteus muscles, um, they come in different sizes and we can kind of compare them. So you have gluteus maximus, medius, and minimus. It's basically large, medium, and small muscles for the um, gluteus muscle group. Um, you can also look at the direction of the fibers um, or the fascicles, right? Usually in relation to like the long axis of the body. Um, so for example, the transversus abdominis muscle, transversus, right, means at right angle to the long axis of the body, so horizontal, um, and abdominis. So not only does that muscle give us its fiber direction, it also gives us its body region. Um, so just by looking at the name of the muscle, we can determine um, kind of in which direction it runs and where it is located, which is pretty darn cool. We can also determine sometimes um, the number of origins that a particular muscle has. Every muscle has at least one origin, um, but some muscles have two, three, or four. So the biceps brachii um, has two origins and it is in the brachial area of the body. So not only are we getting number of origins, we're getting um, location as well. And then some muscle names actually tell you what those origins and insertions are. So the sternocleidomastoid muscle originates at the sternum and the clavicle and inserts on the mastoid process. And it says all that in its name, sterno, sternum, Cleto is a word for clavicle, and then mastoid, meaning the mastoid process. So we are originating at the sternum and the clavicle, 
and inserting on the mastoid process. Um, by knowing origins and insertions, you can then figure out kind of what the muscle is going to move. In this case, of course, it's going to move the head. Um, then the other thing that's really nice about muscle names um, is that very often in their name, they are going to tell you what they do. So we have flexor muscles that cause flexion, extensor muscles that cause extension. We have pronator muscles that cause pronation. We have adductor muscles that cause adduction, etc., etc., and it's right there in the name of the muscle, which is pretty darn cool. Um, and definitely very useful when you're trying to learn muscles. Um, so why don't you take a minute, pause this little lecture here, and see if you can figure out what we can learn about these muscles um, just by looking at their names. And then pick it back up uh, after you've uh, seen what you can do and test how you're understanding this. While, I, while you guys perhaps paused it um, to practice with your muscle naming, I paused my recording as well so I could go help my cat who got stuck in the um, uh, bathroom vanity. I have a cat that likes to climb into the vanity, but this time she got a little stuck and I heard her bouncing around in there. Uh, so we both had a little pause there. Um, so. The, the rest of this chapter is really going to be focused on, uh, or the rest of this lecture really, is going to be focused on muscle mechanics, um, kind of how muscles work in general. Not specifically what each muscle does, but generally just how muscles um, kind of all together work in the body. Um, so there are a couple of things that um, contribute to how kind of forcefully and how fast muscles can contract. Some of that is from chapter nine. So we talked about load and recruitment in, in chapter nine, right? If you have a heavier load, that's gonna be a slower contraction. Um, if you have uh, more recruitment, more muscles involved, that's gonna be faster, you can hold it longer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then also those different fiber types, right? Slow oxidative, fast oxidative, fast glycolytic. Those things all contribute to uh, kind of how strong and how, and how fast muscles are. But then there are a couple other things here in chapter 10, um, specifically what we call the arrangement of the fascicles, i.e. kind of how the fascicles that are um, kind of shaped into the muscle and then lever systems. And that um, is where we're going to head here with the, the rest of this little lecture. Um, so all skeletal muscles, of course, have fascicles, right? It's skeletal muscles that get bundled together into fascicles, fascicles then get bundled into a whole muscle. But um, the arrangements of those fascicles can vary. Um, and so we end up with muscles not only that have different shapes, but then those shapes affect their functional capabilities. Um, we have kind of four common patterns, um, what we call circular muscles, convergent muscles, parallel muscles, and pennate muscles. Um, so um, in some of them in the name, they, they kind of tell you what they are going to be shaped into. So for instance, circular muscles are, of course, well, circular, right? They're round, they're concentric rings of muscle tissue. Um, convergent muscles are going to converge, right? Um, so they have these really, really broad origins that tend to um, kind of narrow towards a single tendon insertion. And so the pectoralis major muscle here um, is a very good example of a convergent muscle. Parallel muscles are muscles that have long, parallel muscle fibers, uh, typically um, in a very strap-like fashion, like the sartorius here. Then we have muscles that are known as fusiform muscles. Um, these remind me of rail spindles. Um, so they're fat in the middle, um, the fibers are running in parallel um, a direction to each other, um, and then two um, an or, you know, origins appear, insertion down here. Then we have pennate muscles. Now, pennate muscles have very, very short fascicles. You can see very, very short fascicles that then attach at an angle to a central tendon that runs the length of the muscle. They can be either unipennate, meaning kind of attached only to one side, bipennate, meaning attached to both sides, on both sides of the single kind of central tendon, or 
you can even have multi-pennate muscles um, where you've got kind of multiple attachments, um, almost like feathers um, that will insert into a, a single tendon then. Um, and so these different shapes of these different muscles um, will affect um, kind of their range of motion, i.e. kind of what is the amount of movement can they do, um, and then their power, their strength. Um, so the range of motion depends on the length of the fibers. If you have a longer fiber, it can do more shortening and thus give you a greater range of motion. Um, power depends on the number of muscle fibers, right? If you can get more fibers, then you can get more power. So muscles that have a good range of motion are generally less powerful than muscles that have more power, but generally a smaller range of motion. So for example, the parallel and fusiform muscles, they're longer, so they've got really good range of motion, but they don't have as many fibers, so they're not as strong. Whereas uh, the bipennate and multipennate muscles, they're fibers are shorter, um, so they don't have as good a range of motion, but they've got more of them, and so they're more powerful. And, and our body is, is really kind of a, a mix of, of all of these different types of muscles. Um, now, the last thing here that we're going to discuss um, is levers, leverage, right? Um, in order for our muscles to work, they have to have something to pull on. Um, and that is our skeleton system. Um, so there are three components to a lever system. There's the lever itself, which is the rigid kind of bar that moves on some fixed point called a fulcrum. So in the body, the um, rigid bar is the bone and the fulcrum, the, the hinge point, is our joints. The effort is then the force um, which we get from our muscle contractions, that is applied then to the lever in order to move some sort of load or resistance. Now, load is what we're moving, but we're not just talking about whatever it is maybe that we're trying to carry, but it's also all of the weight of the bones and the tissues itself. That's part of the load that we have to take into account when we think about um, how our muscles function. Um, so what levers allow us to do um, is to move heavier loads or move loads further and or faster, right? So there's a really famous quote by Archimedes, give me a place to stand and a lever long enough and I will move the world. Um, and that is essentially what our lever systems in our body allow us to do. They allow us to do things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do if we didn't have the lever systems. So let me give you two kind of real world examples um, here in just a second. Um, there are two types of levers. Um, levers that are called power levers, ones that have what we call a mechanical advantage, or speed levers, which means they have a mechanical disadvantage. So in power levers, the load is really close to the fulcrum, the effort is applied farther from the pivot point, but the, and what results from this is that you can use a really tiny effort and still move a large load. Um, so power levers, are, they tend to be slower, um, but they're more stable, and they're much more often used when we're, when we're looking for, for strength. Um, now, speed levers, the load is further from the fulcrum. The effort is applied close to the fulcrum, and the result is that we can move a load really rapidly over a really large distance. Um, so speed levers, not as much force, but we get a greater range of motion and we get greater speed, hence speed levers. So again, how about some real world examples, right? So here is a power lever with a mechanical advantage, right? So the load is really close to the fulcrum, the effort is applied further away from the fulcrum. So here's this gentleman here, he can apply a fairly little effort in order to um, lift the, the load of the rock. Now, conversely, speed levers, the 
load is further away from the fulcrum, the effort is applied fairly close to the fulcrum, and so we lose some force, um, but we gain a lot of speed. And so in this instance, you know, the person jumps down and the acrobat's gonna fly up in the air um, and, and go at really quite a high speed. In fact, actually, it's funny that this is um, what we're talking about right now because I just watched a video the other day on America's Funniest Videos, which is just not a show that I usually watch, but I happened to watch it the other day. Um, and somebody jumped on like a raft out in the middle of a lake and the next thing you know, like the other person on the other side of the raft just went flying off like high into the air and ended up in the lake. It was pretty darn funny, actually. Um, so power levers, small effort moves large load. Speed levers, man, we lose a little power, but we can move loads pretty far and pretty fast. So based on the position of the effort, the fulcrum, and the load, um, we have three classes of levers. First class levers, second class levers, and third class levers. First class levers, the fulcrum is kind of situated between the load and the effort. Um, so scissors are a really good example of that, or a seesaw, right? So we apply the effort here, the load is here. Um, so um, we can apply a little bit of effort and we're able to move the load. Um, so a really good example in the body is uh, the muscles that allow you to kind of raise your head. So the fulcrum here is of course the this pivot joint here, or the occipital joint, excuse me. Um, so we've got a little condylar joint here, that's our fulcrum. The effort is the sternocleidomastoid muscle, um, and the load is essentially the weight of the head. So the effort is applied that moves the load against the fulcrum, um, and that is a first class lever. Second class levers are what you have been using um, anytime you have ever used a wheelbarrow. Um, so these muscles tend to have a mechanical advantage, or so for um, looking for really strong movements, but generally really small movements. In this instance, the load is between the fulcrum and the effort, right? So in the wheelbarrow example, the fulcrum is the wheel, the load is whatever it is that you're trying to haul around in your wheelbarrow, and your effort is here at the end of the wheelbarrow. Um, and if you've ever put too much in your wheelbarrow, that's me, you'll know that even with the greatest lever ever, you're still not moving it. Um, in the body, a really good example is um, what we do when we plant our flex and stand up on our, our tippy toes. Um, so here in, the, in this instance, the fulcrum is the joints in the ball of the foot, the weight of the body is all of the load, um, and then the effort is here supplied by um, some of our calf muscles here in the back. That allows us to lift the load um, on this that, that's between our effort and the fulcrum. So that's a second class lever. And then the most common type of lever that we have in the body and that most of our muscles operate under are third class levers. In this instance, the effort is applied between the load and the fulcrum. Um, if you've ever used tweezers or forceps, that is an example of a third class lever. So here's the fulcrum, you apply the effort here, and then you're able to kind of pick up your object and move your load. Um, these muscles tend to be um, at a mechanical disadvantage, um, so really large movements, really fast movements. Um, so a good example in the body is the biceps brachii. So here is the fulcrum, that's our elbow, the biceps brachii contracting is our effort, and there is the load of the, um, say, weight that we're here trying to lift in order to uh, lift some weights and work out our muscles a little bit. Um, so first class, second class, third class levers. Um, so in terms of what I will expect you to know, for lecture, it, it, it's the functional groups, how muscles work, how muscles are named, um, and some of the basics of muscle mechanics that we just went over, how fascicle arrangements affect speed and power um, and the principles of leverage. Now for lab, you'll have to be able to tell me what the muscle looks like, so you'll need to be able to ID it uh, in a picture, on a diagram, in a on a muscle model, et cetera, et cetera. All of the attachment points, origins and insertions, 
the primary action of the muscle, like what does the muscle do, um, and kind of what its antagonist or um, synergist kind of that kind of functional group type classification may be. Um, the best way to tackle muscles is to tackle them in small pieces. So look at head and neck muscles, then look at your trunk muscles, and I would look at your trunk muscles um, in sections as well. You can look at your breathing and your postural muscles that we find in the thorax, the muscles of the abdominal wall, the shoulder muscles that are going to act on the arm, and then the pelvic muscles that are going to act on the thigh. Um, and then when you look at the upper limb, you can look at the arm muscles that act on the forearm, the forearm muscles that then act on the wrist and hand, and then when you look at the lower limb, the thigh muscles that act on the leg, and the leg muscles that act on the ankle and foot. I would not at any point try to learn it all at once. I would do section by section by section because if you did it all at once it looks kind of like that and you're like oh my god it's too many muscles um, but if we look at let's say just the head muscles you know we're looking at and you know you know five or six or maybe seven eight muscles depending on how many is on that list in lab um, if we're looking at just the thigh muscles you know um, we're looking at much smaller groups of muscles um, or you could also and you could also even not only break it down kind of by region of the body you can break it down by anterior and posterior so just look at the let me go back here for a second so like let's just look at the posterior trunk muscles then go back and look at the anterior trunk muscles or whatever the case may be but just break it into pieces um, because it's much more conquerable um, when you break it into pieces like that.